Okay. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So what I was saying is please turn on your videos if your video is off. Uh, helps me engage the class more. Really makes a big difference for me. Uh, I'm like one of the, my teachers haven't, haven't asked their students to do this, but this is my like trademark to ask you guys to start your videos. Uh, it really makes a difference. It's so easy, but so simple. Kayla Torado will start her video later. What is that? Okay. Well, no, it's okay. Let's see. Uh, all right. Let's see. All right, guys. Well, uh, good morning. And uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I might, I guess I could show you some stuff on the OneNote in the interim. So on the OneNote, I actually put a link to the homework. And uh, basically, rather than actually have each of the documents separately broadcast here, which is what I did in the past, because the nature of what I'm giving you is a little more complicated than what it was in the past, uh, I'm putting it on the Google Drive link. So for instance, if you go to the Google Drive link, you'll see a bunch of stuff. Uh, you'll see a folder that says homework one, but just I'm trying to accommodate all of your uh, preferences. So for instance, if you go here, you can see the question as a PDF, the different questions as a PDF. But I know some of you also wanted uh, like the, the files to, to like print out, um, sorry, to not print out, but to just to like directly work in software. So that's available to you as well. Uh, oh, I just, it just occurred to me that you're not, I'm not sharing my screen. I apologize. All right. Okay, great. I'm sharing my screen now. So I'm going to go to OneNote. And what I see is a link to homework. And so basically, it's under course documents. By the way, the OneNote's been organized a little bit. Um, there's three major folders. There's a theory folder, an activities folder, and a course documents folder. So under this course documents folder, there's a document called homework. And so what you do is you click the document that this top link, which basically opens up uh, a Google Drive link. Um, and everyone has access to it. It's basically publicly shareable on the web. So as of last night, someone requested access and I said, well, we'll just give access to everyone. So share, share it with your friends, share it with your neighbors. Uh, don't, not in person, because don't, you don't want to get them sick, but you know, just give, this, give these homework challenges to everyone you know. Um, there are PDFs. Uh, well, there's one PDF. I guess I'll Sometimes there might be more, but I consolidate them all into one PDF for you guys. Uh, so this is like the traditional way you receive your homework. So if you have a printer, uh, what you could do is you could just print this out or you could, you know, maybe buy a printer or you could, uh, there's, there's probably some service out there that like delivers newspapers or mail to you. I mean, uh, the stuff you want to print to you. I, I don't know enough about it. Uh, but I, I've given you other options as well. Uh, some of you expressed interest in seeing the notation files. So depending on whether you have the software I use, Sibelius, this is, these are the files for Sibelius that you could use to open it up. Um, notice that there's two files. When you get your homework, you just notice, you just, it's just convenient. It's one PDF, but in reality, it's a little bit of a pain to make these homework assignments. And yeah, I, I actually have like two different files because they won't all fit into one file for whatever reason, because they're some, some of the music has two stabs and some of the music has one stab and you can't like mix and match like that. But in case you don't have Sibelius, I actually have music XML files as well. And music XML files, uh, basically, um, they work such that you can open them in a variety of notation softwares. 
Uh, everyone can see what I'm looking at, right? Uh, yes. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Um, great. So they work in, uh, because I'm not actually looking at your, you guys right now. I'm just looking at my screen, uh, what I'm showing you right now. Uh, great. So an example of how you would open this in your software is if you download this, I guess download, yada, yada, yada. Fantastic. Okay. So you open it up. Uh, whoops, you don't want to do that. You go to downloads. Okay. Um, and then you go to yada, yada, yada. You open it with, uh, what is it? You open it with MuseScore. And so MuseScore is a free application that you can download that uh, it's a notation software. Okay. So when you open it with MuseScore, it actually shows up like this. Unfortunately, the formatting isn't perfect. So you actually have to do some like finagling because it's just by virtue of the fact that when I export in this format, it's the only format that I can export in that it actually is, it shows up in, it, it's compatible with all softwares, but it's not perfect as a, each software doesn't convert it perfectly. So you have to like move some stuff around, but when, once you, once you do that, uh, sure enough, you can you can type things in and to your heart's content. And there are a lot of uh, softwares that explain, uh, sorry, a lot of videos that explain how the software works. So you know, you could do things like this. Not to, not to say that, that those are the answers or anything, but uh, uh, you, you're going to kind of have to see how this works if this is the route that you want to use. But it might be more convenient. It's just a matter of moving some stuff around. So if you do if you do download the file, um, you can just file. You can export as uh, gosh, you can export as a PDF. That all works out well. Um, you could also, if you really want to use my software, there's like an academic license to Sibelius that's like five dollars a month, and then the files would work. Uh, it's like eight dollars a month. And in that situation, if you did do that, uh, you could email me if you're interested in that particular software. Um, but uh, the traditional route is to go and get a subscription for uh, $8 a month. Although there are other ways to get this software. If you're interested in that software, just let me know and I can, maybe I, maybe I can help you out. Um, and so the situation with that is you would just open it up. You would just literally open up that file and then, oh, you're not supposed to see that. Um, and it would just appear like this, which is very familiar and nice looking. So let me know. It's uh, $8 a month isn't terrible, but there are other ways. So with that being said, um, hopefully that all makes sense. Um, incidentally, um, Everyone, oh, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> Great. Um, I'm going to see something really quickly. Ah, uh, OK. Wait. Oh, Evan, it's you. It's you. You're the one who has his mic unmuted. OK. So, um, no, it's all good. No, 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 it's okay. I was just wondering where it was coming from. Uh, so this is a good opportunity to tell the class. You, it's best to have your mic muted. And then if you want to talk, just press space bar. So for instance, I'm going to call on someone. I'm going to call on Gabriel. Gabriel, can you say something right now? Gabriel Ag Agagnon? Agagnon, sorry. Say yeah, something. What up? Oh, great. Nothing much, man. Nice, nice to hear. Nice to hear from you this morning. Um, great, Evan. Sorry, now that I've silenced you, I want to hear you again. Evan, why don't you say something for the class? Oh, you have to press spacebar. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'm, I'm actually on my phone, so I don't have a spacebar. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, gotcha. 
Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so anyway, hopefully everyone understands that protocol. It's the 21st century. Actually, the audio engineer really likes that protocol because, you know, for instance, I've got this little thing right here. I guess I'll bring it up over here. This is, you can see this, but, you know, I've got a little recording studio in my house and this button right here is a talk back button. So I'm used to being like talking to the talent in the other room by being, uh, let's roll it again. Take five, things like that. So this is pretty, uh, Pretty nice according to my workflow. But anyway, uh, hopefully this all makes sense concerning the OneNote. The other sort of stuff I need to tell you about this is that when you submit, submit as one PDF. Do not submit pictures. In fact, Canvas won't even let you submit pictures. So what I do, it's sort of a painstaking process. It's not, I mean, it's not really a painstaking process. It's, it's not hard to do at all. There's an application called PDF Bass Batch Stitch. And basically what you can do is you can, it's, I've give you, given you the link to it. You just basically put two PDFs in the correct order that you want, and then you just assemble it into one PDF. It makes all the difference when grading because then the submission is very streamlined for your TAs to grade. So if you're scanning your work, uh, from a, from a phone, like if you actually are printing out this pa piece of paper and you're handwriting your answers, then you could use the Genius Scan app. It's free on Android and iPhone. It's really beautiful. It automatically uh, figures out the dimensions of your paper, and then it uh, it's very seamless to uh, basically uh, combine it all into one PDF. So just really want to emphasize that. So the homework. The homework is up. And I guess now's a good opportunity to actually show you the homework. So a lot of this stuff looks pretty familiar. Key signatures, seventh chords, scales. Oh, look at these scales. The major pentatonic scale, the minor blue scale, the whole tone scale, the C sharp major blue scale. Okay, we'll talk about that today. Um, to be honest, this is really the meat and potatoes of what you're going to be expected to know for, uh, that, I mean, this is really the meat and potatoes of what I'm gonna to talk to you about concerning the homework for, for next week. Um, let me open the next part of the homework. So let's do it. What is called? Uh, oh, I put it right here, 1C homework. So the disadvantage of not having this on OneNote is I actually have to open the files. Okay, I'm just getting used to this. Um, give me a second here. Part two. I guess I could have just opened the PDF, but live and learn. Okay, so part six is basically something very similar to homework seven of last quarter. It's just basically open position uh, voicings and identifying, doing a Roman numeral analysis of the open position chords. And part seven is actually a dictation. And I've given you a little bit of hints. And essentially, there are 22 additional notes that are not filled in here, that you have to fill in yourself. And then there's eight measures of rhythm. And so it's all or nothing. So if you get the rhythm wrong for, for a particular measure, if, in any form, if you, if you accidentally uh, call Let's say this was this, and you and you some I don't know why you would ever do this, but you somehow thought I was this mean, and I would give you a 64th note rhythm. Um, then that's wrong for the entire for the entire measure. So just do your best. Um, on the grand scheme of things, this isn't that much. This isn't a huge part of your your grade for your homework. It's like 10% of your grade. But I'm going to do this from from here on out. I'm going to have some dictation. Uh, I think it's a good thing to do. And again, uh, it's in the dictation audio section of your OneNote. I actually have two different renderings, a regular rendering and a slower rendering. So I guess we can listen to it and enjoy it uh, together. Let me actually make sure that this is going to play. Actually, I'm going to play it and then I'm going to go back to the class. And actually, I'm not even going to go back. Just someone talk back to me afterwards and tell me if you actually heard it.
Did you guys hear that? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Big beats. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. I made it myself. No, well, it was, you know, I had fun. It's, I was thinking about different ways of playing it on the piano. And I was like, wait a second. I'm going to have to give the answer key to, uh, to the TAs anyway. So I actually just wrote it out in Sibelius. And I just, uh, I made the answer key for the TAs. And it's, uh, yeah, thanks. Put a, put a hip hop beat over that and we're, we're good to go. Um, so, yes, we've got uh, this sort of aspect of our homework. And now comes the interesting aspect of how we're going to simulate the other parts of class. I already simulated me starting five minutes after class uh, by pretending I was setting up when really I, it was, I, I went to sleep super late last night, so I apologize. Um, let me simulate the other parts of class um, by actually playing the piano instead of actually singing, because I think the audio quality will be a little better that way. And so what I'll do is, I'm going to go to my handy dandy software over here. I got to do a little bit of configuration. And I've got to go to, let's see. Don't sit. Ah, geez. OK. Sorry. Bear with me. There's a lot of stuff here. This is one of the things I would have liked to have done bef just before. I, I got too many windows open on my Mac. So I'm going to go to keyboard. I'm just going to create a, a, a little piano instrument. This is Ableton software, by the way. And uh, I love this software. Do uh, you ever use MuseScore? Uh, as a regular software, I don't use it. Uh, but I have it. I was just demonstrating on it. It's not my software of choice. Uh, why do you ask? I don't know, because uh, for like composition softwares like you know doing the homework like do you this or do you score or? oh well um you might have missed my spiel on that but no I, I got it i got it oh, I was... got... sorry i can't see your face so i don't know who's talking let me let me get back to uh do i ever use oh here hey how you doing um how are you doing pretty good max um yeah do i ever use MuseScore at, in what capacity for composition uh, I well, I use Sibelius for in that regard. Um, it, it's an, it's it's basically analogous in that regard. Um, but yes, absolutely. Like I have, um, let's see, I've got a bunch of different stuff. Um, I, I love it as a compositional mean. So I was supposed to have a recital this year, uh, but all that stuff didn't end up happening. But you know, you could have. It's a very powerful. Like you know, MuseScore can do this exact thing. It's a very, very powerful software for creating music. So it's a totally different way of working than like the Ableton mindset. But you know, you can generate scores and add dynamics. And yeah, I, I, I love using it uh, to compose. Um, the other completely different way of working, I guess, is using a digital audio workstation like this, where um, you don't at least this particular software does, its strength is not notation. And I love notation. So one of the projects that I embarked on in computer music was to create a quick way to export this sort of notation into, into this sort of notation. And I think it's on my website. There's a plugin. Basically, there's a, basically a Sibelius plugin that I was coding, and I had some help with some friends, that allowed you to export from this format to, um, to this format. Um, it's, it's a different power. In fact, it's funny that you bring that up because this is exactly the reason why I stayed up so late. I was literally, I was thinking, I was up till like four because I was, I was racking my brain against the idea of, I have this, this, um, this software library, BBC Symphony uh, Orchestra, which basically produces really nice uh, orchestral mockups. And it's really integrated well into this sort of landscape. But I prefer when I'm composing, I prefer putting stuff into this landscape. So the reason I have so many softwares open is, is to see if I could somehow experiment in such a way where I could use the strengths of this sort of software and this sort of software. And maybe I have to refer to a different software where it's more strong. And in fact, I did. Anyway, that's more information than you probably asked for. But um, it's uh, long story short, there are many different paradigms in which you can compose and, and, and work in. And uh, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. But all the stuff that you're learning is, is 
applicable in a variety of environments. So this software, for instance, it doesn't give you notation per se. In fact, it doesn't have notation uh, in its vanilla implementation, but it has all kinds of cool sounds. And if you're familiar with piano playing, which I guess you are at this point, um, you could just literally play in, I mean, in the standard protocol without doing anything fancy like I was just talking about, is just playing in stuff. So let me actually set up my audio device so that you can hear me. In fact, I gotta turn on this keyboard. Um, it's turning on. And then I think what will happen is, as I play piano in the software, you'll be able to hear me through Zoom. Do you hear me? It's really uh, quiet. No, it's not really quite. Quiet. Oh, it's, it's, it's quiet? Um, let me, uh, uh, okay, this is quiet, huh? Not anymore. We can okay. hear it. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I guess at this point, let's do this. Let's go back and let's try to simulate the other earlier aspect of class. This is a learning process for me as well. And this is a good opportunity to show off the OneNote. And really quickly about the OneNote, some of you guys had difficulty opening this document in the dedicated application. But one of the things I did yesterday was I added you all manually. It was sort of a tedious process because you can't batch add emails. You have to individually add each one as far as I could tell. And the dot, yeah. So anyway, long story short, I added you all. So if you download the application for Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, Linux, whatever, your iPhone, your desktop, it doesn't really matter. There, there's an app for it. Um, and if you sign in to the app using your UCSD email, this this notebook will appear immediately. So for for an even more optimal viewing experience, that is there. So what I'm doing is I'm going to go to this activity section and I'm going to go to our classic singing exercises now. It's important that you still keep up with this stuff because you will have performance quizzes. And if I refer to this handy dandy syllabus right here, there uh, is a performance quiz on week four, on April 21st and April 23rd. And no, it's, it's no longer April Fool's Day. So that is, that is a true statement. Uh, it's, it's tragic. It's my favorite day of the year and I cannot class. It's too bad. Um, but yes, there will be a performance quiz on week four. There will be a performance quiz on week eight and a performance quiz quiz on week 10. And the exact details are to be determined, but something that you'll have to do is sing an exercise for your TA. And they might actually ask you to sight sing during their window. So it's just important to practice this stuff. And you'll get more, more and more fluent at this as you do your dictation. Because when you're doing dictation, there really is no choice but to sing, at least in your head, in, in, at minimum, internally singing. Um, what you're hearing so that you can reproduce it and practice it and actually notate it. But if you're not able to actually internally do it, I, I will always sing what, I, what I'm trying to transcribe or, or dictate as a way of really amplifying the internal dialogue or the internal voice in my head so that I can actually verify that that's indeed what I'm hearing and then I can actually notate what I want to do. So let's open this Dave, Dave's me, uh, weird website, Dave, Dave Smay, Dave Smay website. And let's do some melodies for sight singing. So since your microphones are off, I'm going to literally ask you to sing. I know this is the first time I've actually had to ask anyone to do this um, over Skype. Although I, as I told you, I was, I'm actually taking voice lessons. I've been taking them for a couple of years. It's really good to sing. And I had to sing to my teacher over Skype. So I'm not actually going to ask you to press space bar when you're singing, but I do want you to sing. And I think it'll be good for, for your musicality and your development. And you can sing along to my piano playing right now. First, we're going to do a classic warm up. On an ah, okay? I'm not going to actually sing it, but I want you to, I want you to play it, okay?
cool joke I could play is I could actually unmute. I have the power to unmute someone, so I could actually verify if you're singing. So make sure you're singing because I actually have your windows open right now. And uh, ah, okay, it's important, very very important. Uh, thank you guys for turning on your uh, your camera. Other professors haven't picked up on this idea, but it's so important. Uh, some of you guys still turn on your cameras. Uh, if you don't have them, then I guess that's impossible. But uh, very good. Let's actually sing this one right here. Okay, so we're in the key of F major. This is illustrated by the fact that there's one flat. And if we refer, just, just as a little ref, refresher, there are many ways to, to process this information, but the way I like doing it is the most long-winded way, which is, uh, by the way, I reorganized it. So it's under scales, keys and scales. So if we go to keys and we go to the circle of fifths, what you see is, well, you see a circle, first of all, and you see letters and each letter is a perfect fifth away from the letter that's right next to it on the circle of fifths. Okay, so that much is clear. So perfect fifth above C is G, perfect fifth above G is D, et cetera, okay? I'm just being verbose here because there's some students that haven't uh, learned, haven't taken 1B and they're in 1C. And also, spring break, I don't know, you, you guys might have been partying in Miami Beach and, and hopefully not, and you might have forgotten everything about music theory. But anyway, uh, a perfect fifth above C is G, a perfect fifth above G is D. The key of C major, and what these, what these actual letters represent are actual keys, um, not pitches, they represent keys. Uh, so, the key of C major has zero sharps. The key of G major has one sharp. The key of D major has two sharps. Um, going on and on clockwise along the circle of fifths, and you will eventually get to the keys that have six and even seven sharps. Uh, it actually goes on for infinity, but at some point you have to ask yourself, do I really need seven sharps? Or if I or can I get by with just having five flats? So for instance, the key of C sharp major is the same and harmonically as the key of D flat major. However, the key of C sharp major, C, G, D, maybe I can do that while scrolling along circle of fifths. That's seven sharps. That's a lot of sharps, okay? The key of C sharp major. Um, what if I went backwards on the circle of fifths? Okay, that's only five flats. So if I went backwards, I would get to the same pitch because D flat is the same as C sharp. And this key has five flats. So ostensibly you would you would usually prefer D flat major over C sharp major because it's it's uh, it's got less accidentals, and I think that's the point of it. Accidentals aren't meant to torture you. I think in some ways they're meant to make your life easier, so you, that you have to read less of them in general throughout the score, provided you actually learn the key signature in advance. So, with that spiel in process, if you have one flat. Well, one flat just means one trip along the circle of fifths. So you start from C and one trip counterclockwise along the circle of fifths. So we are either in, and you know what, let me actually bring up my minor key circle of fifths. We are either in F major or we are in D minor. And so in this particular case, we're in F major and great. Okay, so F major is such. F is the first scale degree of F major, G is the second scale degree of F major, and A is the third scale degree of F major. So in this particular case, um, oops, sorry. In this particular case, in fact, this might be a good opportunity for me to actually download this and then open this in PDF Expert with PDF Expert. OK. 
Okay? So this right here is the third scale degree, whereas this is the second scale degree and this is the first scale degree, correct? Another way of writing the third scale degree is by saying that this note is me, this note is re, and this note is do, right? Immovable do. Okay. So movable dough is a relative system. Um, okay, so I, I'll just type this up so you can see it live. Movable dough is a relative system um, that basically shows you. It, it basically always shows you the notes of the scale in relation to the key in relation to the tonic of the key. So do will be the tonic of this key. And we're in F major, as we already determined in the previous step, we're in F major. So in, that, in this situation, mi is the third scale degree, re is the second scale degree, and do is the first scale degree. Now, on your homework, I've had this bad habit, or a good habit, depending on how you look at it, of, of always of seemingly on this particular past part of the homework, I've had this exercise be in C major pretty much consistently. So do will be the tonic of this key. Okay. We're not in that, we don't have that luxury here. In this particular case, uh, we're done because you don't have to do any, you don't have to take any trips along the circle of fifths to find out what note is do. In the key of C major, C is do. In the key of F major, F is do. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense, or that hopefully that still makes sense. Because at some point, I think it, it made sense to everybody. Um, it's a little bit confusing, but this is this is what it is. Um, okay. Let's sing this, okay? And let's use solfege on me. Me two, ready, go. Good luck. Ready, go. One more last time for good luck. old exercise. We could have done it one more time for bad luck, but that would be counterproductive. Um, okay, let's do another one. This one right here is in bass clef, but the key signature is blank, which makes us wonder, well, actually, it makes us pretty much certain that we are in this key, one of these two keys, either C major or A minor. Now, Incidentally, if, if this stuff is difficult to search, you can always search for stuff in OneNote. Uh, so you can actually search for like circle of fifths in case you want to reference this later and you forget where it is. And I basically went to the minor circle of fifths. And that's how I found it. But this key signature encodes the fact that we're either C major or we're in A minor. And let's look at some of the notes. Let's look at the starting pitch. The starting pitch is C, correct? The ending pitch is C. Okay. This already kind of suggests very strongly that we're in the key of C major instead of the key of A minor. Not only that, this exercise header actually tells you that we're basically sticking to the tonic triad in major keys, in case you didn't read this, which I didn't. Um, so in this particular case, we can call C Do. Okay. <clears throat> and this is, uh-huh, yeah, you got it. Okay, class, what? Perfect. I'm just kidding. No one was actually saying anything. I was just pretending. I was, I was just pretending that you guys were saying stuff. All right, re, me. All right. So then we have re, do. So, so, so what? So la, la t, t, do, do. Great. All right. Hey, I actually like that someone phoned in there. It's, it makes me feel like there's actually people there instead of me talking to myself, which 
probably seems so strange to whoever's watching me doing this right now in, in physical real life, but uh, this is cool. It's strange that there's 50, 60 people watching me right now over the internet. But very good. This is do ti do re mi re do so so la ti do do. Okay. Okay. This is do. Okay. Ready? Go. Pull up your faces again. So, oh, whoops, looking that by accident. Uh, okay, great. Um, let me do one more, and then I actually do want to talk about the blues and some of those scales that I, I need to talk about. But let me actually go to a minor key example and just refresh you on some minor solfege. Where is it? Okay, minor melodies. Great. So this again has no key signature, so we're either in the key of C major or we're in the key of, key of A minor. In this particular case, we are in A minor, and so this note right here is La. Right. Oh, sorry, give me a second here. Uh, gosh. Okay, yeah, this is La, right? Because I mean, just because I say it is, from, from one standpoint, we can either use movable do or we can use movable la. And the advantage of using movable la, I could go back and show you, is this. So if I use la, ti, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la to show a minor key, well, I can basically say every single pitch of the minor, oh, you know what? Um, never mind, it's okay for now. Well, maybe I'll do this really quickly. And you can tell me if this is better. It's gonna be a little more difficult on my end to see. But I did this for one of my professors and he thought it was better, so. Is this better? Is this better? Anyone? Can you hear me? Not yeah. much difference. No, not much. No, not much difference. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna go back actually because it's a little harder for me to. I think it depends on. Sorry. Give me a second. I think it depends on the situation. Um, like if you're looking at lines of text, that can't be scalable. Or maybe my professor was just being nice. I'm glad you guys are being honest. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what we have here is um, law-based minor to show you a C natural minor scale, okay? So what you see is that all this chromatic solfege is unmodified, meaning you don't, sorry, all this solfege is unmodified, which means that there are no chromatic solfeges. It's la, ti, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, right? There's no like te or se or, or, or fi or re, right? You can, you can basically represent every single note of the minor scale using one of our unmodified solfeges. But if I use do-based solfege to represent a minor, let's look at the same exact thing. Well, what we have is do, re, me. Look at that. We have modified solfege right there. Fa, so le, modified solfege, te, okay? So that's, in a nutshell, the advantage of using la-based minor when you're dealing with minor keys because you don't have to modify the solfege, okay? That's a confusing to understand. That's why I just wanted to tell you again. Do with that information what you will. Let it percolate. It's not as theoretically important to know why as it is to just be able to do it practically speaking. So anyway that spiel behind us, let us actually, knowing the fact that this is la, let us actually sing this. So I'll give you a la. I gave you many la's that time. So let's just la. Okay, ready? Go.
Okay, so we have la so, okay, so we have la so fa, excuse of capitalization, mi, fa, mi, mi. Now this is modified solfege, right? Because if you skip a step, you go mi, fa, so, well, it can't be so, it's so sharp, which is C, T, right? Do, T, La, C, Mi, C. Now you see me, now you don't. La, La, So, Fa, Mi, Fa, Mi, Mi, C, T, Do, T, La, C, Mi, C, La. Okay, let's do that one more time, and then we'll move on to other stuff. Ready? Two. Okay. Very good. Okay. Okay, let me actually move on to some other scales. And I'm going to type this up and kind of show you what, what we're talking about. So this is actually interesting. I'm actually pleased at this order of operations. It was somewhat unintentional, but it was a happy accident. So some scales, like natural minor and major, have a direct relationship between keys and scales, which is why I actually combine these two sections. Instead of having a key section and a scale section, they're actually interrelated a lot of the times. Meaning, a key signature tells you, essentially, all the notes of a scale as well. What a key signature really tells you is all the notes of a major scale and all the notes of its related minor, natural minor scale, okay? So for instance, a key signature tells you that these are the pitches that you could use if you're in major, or these are the same pitches, just albeit, albeit in a different order, if you want to be in natural minor. You wouldn't start with do, you would start with la, okay? So there's a direct relationship between the key signature and the scale. So there's a confluence between keys and scales. That doesn't always occur. And you might notice this, right? For scales like harmonic minor, there's not like a direct relationship between the scale and the key signature, right? Because look at this. In C harmonic minor, you see the seventh scale degree is raised. I mean. It's hard, it might be hard to see that it was originally flat and you naturalized it and now it's raised, right? So there's a little bit of a disagreement between the scale and the key signature, right? This becomes more apparent. Does that make sense? If anyone has any questions, please pipe in. Um, yeah, I, I actually have a question for the whole class. Um, I, is this professor make anyone else extremely turned on because same? Oh, wow. I don't know what to say to that, except thank you, uh, I guess. OK, well, I, I have no idea who said that. But uh, I guess you would be in a recent, uh, OK, well, anyway, let's, let's move on. Uh, all right, how, do, how does one move on from that? Uh, let's see. I'm going to show you some scales where that relationship doesn't exactly apply, OK? There's not a direct relationship between the key and the scale. There are some similarities. So one of the scales I'm going to show you is called the pentatonic scale. Oh, sorry. I've got to restart my software really quickly. Um, <clears throat> I hope that I, it actually plays through. Um, I might have to do a little bit of diagnosis to figure out if this works. All right. All right. All right. Does that? Do you guys hear that? No. Okay. Oh. That is a bummer. Oh, this is probably why. Do you hear that now? Yes. Oh. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Okay. 
so what we're going to start out now with is I'm going to give you a scale called the pentatonic scale. This is the major pentatonic scale. And sorry, there's like extra, you know what? I'm going to be a little, I'm going to live on the edge here. And being that I'm going to actually have to uh, change, I'm going to upload this to you eventually. I'm just going to delete the bottom staff. Okay. In fact, maybe I'll make this a measure of 6-4, just for fun. So I can see it in one measure. So this right here is the major pentatonic scale. And what's interesting about the scale, well, there's, there's a couple of things to notice about the scale. So if I actually bring up the uh, mixer, sorry, the piano, uh, the keyboard, um, well, I'll show you this after the fact. Um, let's just let's just determine the intervals in here, okay? So this interval right here, from the first note to the second note, is a major second, correct? This interval from here to here is also a major second, right? And you might say, "Wait just a second, and you would be correct, because what we have here is a minor third, okay? Over here, what you have is major second. And over here, what you have is minor third. Okay. Which is seconds well weighted. Now, this is interesting because this is a, this is the first example of a scale I've given you where there's actually not a sequential ordering of the notes on the staff, meaning we're skipping pitches on the staff. Alphabetically speaking, we're skipping like an F, for instance, and we're going straight to the G. We're skipping the A, we're sorry, we're skipping the B, and we're going to the C. That's interesting. Um, this already is presents challenges in terms of spelling. Like, what if I spelled it like this? That would technically, I mean, this is like less important, right? I could actually. I mean, I could potentially call it either way, but let's just, for, for simplicity's sake, let's actually label these scale degrees. What they are traditionally referring, referred to as is this is the first scale degree. Oh, sorry, give me a second here. Traditionally, the scale degrees that these are associated with are one, which is do. Whoops. Then we have two, which is re, right? Then we have three, which is me. Literally, it's me. And we have four. Oh, let's see. Four, which is fa. Then we have uh, so. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. What am I saying? I'm so used to traditional scales. This is so. This is six. This is la. And this is one, which is do. OK? Great. So this is one of the skills that we have to know. Incidentally, I want to show you something kind of cool. If I repeat this all, and I put it over here, I actually keep the same time signature. Sorry, for the sake of clarity, I'm just going to do this so it looks nice and pretty. OK. And then I shift page up this whole thing. You might be amazed when I, when I do this next thing. I hope so. Um, oh, I, I changed my shortcut, whoops. Bear with me. I'm doing the same exact thing. I should change my shortcut so you can see it as easily. These pitches right here, oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> What's interesting about the pentatonic scale is this. Sorry. Why is, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Give me a second. Sorry. Okay, great. Notice something here. This intervallic combination are the black keys on the piano. You have a major second. Sorry, let me make this bigger. What you have is a major second, then you have another ma major second, then you have a minor third, then you have a major second, and then you have a minor third. Now this, this scale is so common and popular for a reason. It's just a very, very nice sounding scale. It's popular in India, it's popular throughout Asia, it's popular everywhere in the world. It's just in Native American music, in the blues music. Um, it's a very significant scale and it's so easy to access just by playing the black keys on the piano. It's the major pentatonic scale. Um, so that's interesting on its own accord. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to press ahead. I'm going to tie these scales together as best as I can. Um, uh, we haven't talked about modes yet. But a mode, basically, we're going to get to it at the end of the quarter. A mode is just basically re-inverting a scale. So I'm going to do a very crude example of this. If I have all the pitches of the C major scale, right? Looks kind of strange and crazy, right? If I repeat this, and I basically, if I repeat this and I take the bottom note of the scale, well, I'll, ex whoops, sorry, give me a second. I exclude the top note and I bring the bottom note up an octave, then I basically I've inverted the scale in some way, in some way of thinking about it. In other words, we'll talk more about this later, but. Now, if I have a, a measure of C major right here, the C major scale. Oh, gosh. Bear with me. OK, and then uh, looking for a particular shortcut. Oh, there it is. Bam. OK. And I invert the scale, where instead of starting on the first note of the scale, I'm starting on the second note of the scale. I've basically inverted it, right? This is really where you can kind of think of the natural minor scale, which is right here, as an inversion of the major scale, if that makes sense. You're basically starting on a different pitch. And the, a different note is on the bottom instead of C. A is on the bottom, right? That's a way you can think about scales. This is all to say that this is the major pentatonic scale. And the minor pentatonic scale is actually just an inversion of the major pentatonic scale. Instead of starting on C, I would start on A. And now what we have is the minor pentatonic scale. OK? Hopefully you guys are following along so far. And I'll annotate this more thoroughly, and I'll put this on the one note in a, in a more clear way. I'm just, I like doing things in real time. So I can kind of show you the thought process instead of you looking at a picture and being like, where do I start? Well, it gives you somewhere to look. So anyway, so just to re-show you the intervals because they got deleted last time. I have major second, and then I have minor third, right? Whereas right here, the intervals pre pre predictably will be, <clears throat> excuse me, will be rearranged. So I have a minor third right here. <clears throat> excuse me again. <clears throat> Excuse me, for the last time. And then I have a major second right here, right? Then I have, uh, sorry, there's more, there's more coming. Um, I have a minor third right here, and then I have a major second right here. Get some water. Very good. OK. And what you see is you basically see the scale inverted. Um, so this is a minor pentatonic scale. You might have heard of the acapella group, the pentatonics. Well, it's sort of a play on this idea, the pentatonic scale. And every time the pentatonic sings a song, they have to uh, they have to pay a royalty fee to the scale, the company that invented the scale. I'm just kidding. That's not true. Um, Anyway, these are two scales. Now, we can actually get a little further. I, it's amazing how much time 
you can spend on this stuff. I was expecting it to get a little further today, but it doesn't matter. You can modify the major pentatonic scale by adding one note, and I'm going to change this key signature. Sorry, the reason I'm changing this, these time signatures is so that the correct number of notes fits into this layout so it looks nice. So, which actually, incidentally, the pentatonic, sorry, the major blues scale actually has seven notes instead of six notes. And it has this extra note. It's, it's very similar to the major pentatonic scale. It's the major blues scale. Right? It's the major blues scale. Just by adding this third note, this little blue note right here, you're, you're, it's basically split third. You have a flat three and you have a, you have a regular three. Right? It makes it sound really bluesy. Okay, great. So, right. Okay. The other one that I'm going to explain to you is the minor blues scale. And you might find it surprising, or you might not find it surprising. I have a question. Yes. For your minor pentatonic scale, are the intervals the same? Is that why you didn't write them? or? Uh, no, the intervals are actually different. So let me actually write them out. Um, thanks for asking. So this right here is a minor third. It's, it's basically, the intervals will be shifted. So you're starting from this note right here. So it'll basically start with this interval, and the next interval will be this interval, and the next, if you follow what I mean. Because this is, this, this is basically, whoops, and two. This scale is inverted. Is this scale just inverted? If you catch my drift, and I'll show you, I'll show you more clearly what I mean by that. So minor third. I should really have a second screen so I could see all your faces while I on another separate screen while I work. Um, so what you have right here essentially is if you go from here and you see a minor third, major second, major second, minor third, major second. Minor third, major second, major second, minor third, major second. If you catch my drift, it's basically, it's just starting the intervals from this note right here. Are you, are you following along with what I'm saying? Like this is, what, so if this yeah, is- it's okay, kind of shifted. It's saying. shifted, exactly. So if I, I'm, I'm gonna highlight these in order and notice that the note, the intervals that I highlight over here are the, in, in order are gonna be the intervals that you're gonna see over here in order. Right? It corresponds to this. So that is like characteristic of, of, of a scale that's being inverted. Um, I'll transfer these intervallic. Uh, oh, yeah. Do you have another question? Oh, no. I just heard some sound and I um, assumed. Do you, do you mind just giving us an example of all of these, like using an actual scale, like a C major blues or something like that? Yeah, sure. So how it sounds, pentatonic scale, a major pentatonic scale. Um, I guess I can play it in Sibelius. It's just gonna, it's gonna go berserk. Oh, it's actually not. It's gently pressing. I don't know if you can see this, but it's gently pressing the notes. Um, an example of how this sounds, major and minor pentatonic scales. If I, if I just glissando, basically I'm taking the back of my hand and playing the black keys. <laughs> Have you guys heard that sound before? Probably, right? That's the sound of the pentatonic scale in its purest form, without adding any blues modifications. Um, more so, do you mind just like showing us how to write it? Oh, sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so let's actually try this out. Oh, incidentally, this actually gives me an opportunity to show you this. Did you guys get my email about flat.io? So basically, did you get, hopefully you guys got it. You probably have been getting lots of emails from me. Um, so essentially what I did was I created documents for all of you guys. And, and I created documents for everyone, basically. And 
what, what happens there is there's an assignment and actually I got uh, a student, Connor, to actually demonstrate, to test this and it works. And basically what, what it is, is you'll see a little doodle pad here and you could actually uh, type in, uh, sorry, give me a second here. This is, this is related to your question, sorry, Tate. Um, it's just taking a second to refresh. This is a way that I can verify what you're doing. And you could actually, for instance, Tate could actually type this in and I could actually look at a score in real time. And uh, it's not playing nice right now. Um, okay, so here's Connor's, Connor's thing. I can just open it up right now. It normally doesn't take this long. Um, it's optimized for Chrome. Uh, it's, it's acting a little strange right now. Sorry. Give me, give me one sec. Sorry, Tate. Internet's fault, or it's just the web administrator's fault. Uh, gosh, there's something weird going on right now. Okay, I'm gonna forget about this. I'm gonna to complain to the web administrator and tell him later um, about this situation. It normally works really well. Um, but anyway, if I were to ask you to write this, for instance, with a starting pitch of G, uh, let's say we have a, a major pentatonic scale, that's the expectation. And I want you to write it with a starting pitch of G. Well, what you would do is you'd have to know the intervallic identity of this scale. There's two ways of looking at it, actually. Notice how this is really a subset of a major scale. Can you guys see how that's true? Meaning, if I did this, oh, I, this sucks. Sorry, I, I associated, ah, sorry, give me a second. Okay, great. They're all associated again correctly. Okay, notice this really quickly. Notice how a major scale, if you leave out the fourth and seventh scale degree, what you get is a major pentatonic scale. So Tate, that's like probably, in fact, that's probably the simplest way to do it because you know how to write a major scale. So if you leave out the fourth and seventh scale degree, that's what you get. However, if you want to really do it the intervallic way, you could do it just as well that way as well. So for instance, if I start with G, I have to go a major, let me shift these so they're correctly aligned. I was a little too fast and loose when I was typing this up to, to make sure they're correlated correctly. It was correlating to the other staff. Um, great, so a major second above G is A, a major second above A is B. A major third, I'm sorry, a minor third above B is D. And then a major second above D is E. And a uh, minor third above E is G. And then there you have it. Okay. What about for making that scale a blue scale? Like okay, so, so if you want to make that a blue scale, it's actually quite simple. All you have to do is you have to add, you have to basically add a flat third. So this is the first, second, third. I'm going to shift this over one. 
So now I have two thirds, right? They're the same note. I'm just going to flat one of them. That's how you do it. So essentially the scale, okay, so here, here's a way to think about it. This is actually a good foreshadowing. This is great because if, I was going to tell you about some jazz, some, it's part of the syllabus actually, the ninths, elevenths, and thirteenths. This is a great opportunity to tell you how I can concisely represent the scale using scale degrees. So if, I, if I'm on the blue scale, it's basically one, actually two, flat three, sorry, give me a second, three, five, six, Da, 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 da. Okay. What this notation means is this, this is the following. This notation actually means if, if it's not modified with a flat, it means that these are the scale degrees that you, these are the notes of, of the major scale. Okay. If it is modified, you would just modify that note of a major scale. So this is the blue scale formula in sort of a jazz definition that you'd probably find on the internet, which is, some, is, which is something worth talking about because you're going to have to understand this convention when we talk about separate chords. It's not too hard to follow. So if, if just to kind of ex explore this topic for a second, if I gave you these scale degrees, it's really not so bad. One, two, three, five, six. What do these uh, scale degrees encode if we're talking about the key of C major. Well, one would correspond to C, two would correspond to D, three would correspond to E, five would correspond to G, and six would correspond to A, correct? Now, if I did one, two, flat three, three, five, six, which is the definition of the blue scale, one would correspond to C, two would correspond to D, Flat three, well, three would correspond to E, but flat three would correspond to E flat. Three would correspond to, well, E, right? Five would correspond to G, and then six would correspond to A. Um, Tate, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Is there a minor blue scale too, or is that the only? There is a minor blue scale. Okay. So let me create a new document right now. New page. So the minor blue scale, let me get on to back to the, the Sibelius file. We'll, we'll hold off on talking about the whole tone scale. So the major pentatonic scale and the major blue scale are related. Okay, so this is the major pentatonic scale. Then this is the minor pentatonic scale. This is the major blue scale. And let me just quickly type up the minor blue scale. And this is the minor blue scale. Okay. And what you see is really this. You see that, let me squeeze these together a little bit so you can see everything. Oh gosh. Come on. Ah, gosh, doesn't like me right now. Oh, oh my gosh. I'm so, guys, I apologize. Give me a second here. This is ridiculous. It's core. It's associating these intervals with the wrong staff. This is one of the reasons I hate the software. But I love it for many other reasons. Okay, gosh. I'm under pressure right now, guys. I know you guys are watching me and I'm like, I'm stumbling. I'm just making mistakes I normally wouldn't make. Um, You're good, okay. don't worry. Okay, <laughs> cool. All right, great. So the major blue scale right here is, well, why not? Okay, so the major blue scale is you can see it's very similar to the pentatonic scale, the major pentatonic scale. The only difference is you're adding in a flat three scale degree. The minor blue scale is actually, let me bring it down to the same octave, is actually almost identical to the pentatonic scale, except you're adding in a flat five scale degree. 
Okay. So let me actually show you this. I'm just going to show you, I'm going to create a document. Formulas, formulas, and I'll rename this in a more sensible way soon. So what we have here is we have, well, major blues. One, two, three, what, oh, sorry, whoa. Major pentatonic. One, two, three, five, six. Minor pentatonic. Let's use, let's use, okay, so what we have is one flat three, four, five, da, 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 da. flat seven. Okay, then we have major blues, which is one, two, flat three. Three, five, six. Then we have minor blues, which is one flat three, four, flat five, five, flat seven. So I guess the takeaway here is notice how similar this is to this. One, two, three, five, six versus one, two, flat three, three, five, six. Notice how similar this is to this. One, flat three, four, five, flat seven, versus one, flat three, four, flat five, five, flat seven. If that makes sense. I know this sort of way of describing um, Scale degrees might be a little confusing to you, but really just think about this as solfege. One is do, it's just basically using movable do. One is do, flat three is me, fa, so, te, right? Right? That's really all this is, but this is the jazz way of representing this. I'm an exception. I love jazz, but I also am obsessed with solfege. Um, but yeah, this is the more traditional way of representing this information, if that makes sense. So what you would essentially do is if, if I were to ask you to do a G minor pentatonic scale, well, you would think about this in this, in these terms, you would just have to apply these solfege syllables or these scale degrees to G minor which would be, well, the first, to, I mean, to the key of, well, starting on G. So G would be the first one. What is, what is the third note of the G major scale? B. B, and then you flat that, so you have B flat, right? Because it's flat three, right? If it were the third note, we would just leave it as B. What is the fourth note of the G major scale? C. Uh, C, C senor or senorita, or whoever said that. Um, what is the fifth note of the G major scale? D. What is the seventh note of the G major scale? F sharp, right? F. But what is what happens when you flat the seventh note? Well, it's just F natural, right? So that's how you do a minor pentatonic scale, if that makes sense. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Hey, may I ask? Oh, of course. Uh, so in this class, are we required to use a movable, movable, sorry, fixed dough or movable dough or it, anything we prefer? Uh, it, you're going to expect, be expected to use movable dough a lot. My, my, dear, my uh, belief is that if you know how to do movable dough, you know how to do fixed dough. Because movable dough is just, fixed dough is just movable dough in C major. So okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just asked because these examples are then changed to the fixed though and not composers. No, no, this example is actually uh, movable though. Because this is movable though is agnostic to key. So if this were if this were fixed though, I would do right. This is fixed though, but this is movable though. Oh right. Yeah, I love both of them, and so I, I uh, yeah, so movable though, yeah. Movable dough, essentially, I never told you guys what fixed dough is, but fixed dough is really, you always call C dough. You always call D, Ray. 
you always call me E, etc. Movable do is you always call the tonic of the key do. In case other people don't know, because I think I, you're new to the class, I think, because I don't re recognize you. Uh, yes, I took the one B two years ago. Okay, well, welcome to the class. Okay. Um, great. So anyway, class, um, I got here five minutes late, and I finished five minutes late. So thank you for your patience. And uh, I have recorded this, and I have to figure out a way to upload this. And I think the other one might have gotten destroyed somehow, but I'm going to see if it isn't. Um, and if not, I can upload that as well. If, if you guys want to torture yourself and watch an hour and a half of this for fun. But um, anyway, if you have any questions, do you have any questions about homework or anything like how, where to submit it on Canvas and things like that? Or does this all make sense to you? Um, for the dictation, um, do we assume that it's in C major? Well, for the dictation, um, it's actually, uh, let's see. So if I go to 1C homework and I go to dictations, well, I give you the starting pitch is what I'm getting at. So I give you, I give you some clues. So yes, you would assume, but it's, it's given to you that's in C major. So yes. Um, and I heard another utterance. Did anyone uh, say something? Forever hold your peace. Now's your chance. I'm never, I'm never going to open up the class for questions ever again. So you better, you better say what you were going to say. All right, have it your way. No, I'm just kidding. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys can sign on, sign off if you want. But if you have no further questions, I, I will be here for office hours. So hang out here. Or, do what, do what you want. Sometimes I forget to close this window, so you might open it up later and be like, just see my room or something. Um, but anyway, great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I'll stop recording. Thank you so much.